Did you know that one quarter of white households in the USA have a net worth greater than $1 million? And this is true for only 4% of black households? We'll discuss this and other interesting facts about immigration, race and ethnicity, and social movements with sociologist and writer Dr. Hajar Yezdaha on this episode of The Curious Professor. everyone, I'm Dr. B. Welcome to the Curious Professor podcast, where I take listeners on a journey of discovery to explore the people, places, artifacts, and natural wonders that spark my curiosity. On this episode of the Curious Professor podcast, we'll explore the mechanisms underlying the politics of inclusion and exclusion as they shape ethno-racial identities, intergroup relations, and political culture with author and scholar Dr. Hajar Yazdaha. But first, a trivia question. Where did Dr. Martin Luther King give his famous I Have a Dream speech? I'll have the answer for you at the end of this episode. I'm thrilled to have Dr. Hajar Yazdaha on the show today. Dr. Yazdaha is an assistant professor of sociology and faculty affiliate for the Equity Research Institute. She received her PhD in sociology from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and is a former Ford postdoctoral fellow. Dr. Yazdaha's new book entitled The Struggle for the People's King, How Politics Transforms the Memory of the Civil Rights Movement examines how a wide range of rivaling social movements across the political spectrum deploy competing interpretations of the civil rights movement to make claims around national identity and inclusion. Welcome to the show, Hajar. It's great to have you here. Thanks so much for having me. What's the most unique thing about you? Well, I think one thing that always surprises people is that I, you know, I'm an Iranian immigrant. I always talk about being the child of Iranian immigrants, um, although I did grow up here. And then the thing that really surprises people is that I've never actually been to Iran. I was born in Germany. And, you know, for me, one of the stories that I like to share, because I think it really says a lot about the way I approach my research, the way I think about the world is that my name, Hajar, means someone who has traveled a long way from their homeland. And it really was the experience of my parents leaving Iran with my mom pregnant with me that shaped their decision to name me Hajar. And so I think, you know, it's interesting that I then became a researcher who thinks about these questions of migration and identity and belonging. As you mentioned, you were born in Berlin, Germany. You're the daughter of Iranian political refugees. And you've stated that your life has been spent and indelibly shaped by living in the United States as a child of immigrants. Can you tell us more about that particular perspective that you've gained as a child of immigrants? Absolutely. Yeah. I think so many children of immigrants talk about this kind of feeling of not quite knowing your place, being in between. I actually saw a joke on Twitter at some point. It was a a sort of thread about, you know, like how many of us have written our college essays about that sort of feeling of interstitiality, like how many of us have used that sort of in-between language. And I laughed because I actually think I may have done that in my college essay as well. But, you know, there's some truth to it because I think especially for those of us who don't have sort of a strong connection to the homeland, who who did not have sort of opportunity to go visit regularly, um, you know, who may have had sort of fraught relationships with the homeland as, you know, in the case of my parents, they were really political activists. They, but they don't fall into the sort of neat narrative that a lot of Iranian Americans have where they came to the States and, you know, were sort of anti-Iran, really embraced, you know, American identity and were very pro-America. This is something that we even saw more recently with the protests, you know, the the sort of feminist protests uh, against the hijab mandate. And, And for me, it was never quite that simple because, you know, for my parents, they never quite fell on one side or the other. They, they never felt like completely anti-government or, you know, completely pro-activist. They always had a sort of larger and more idealist vision that never came to fruition. So, you know, for me growing up at the dinner table when I'm like five years old and you were talking about Marx and, you know, I'm a kid and I'm trying to use words like, oh, that kid is so weird. And you know, they're like, what does weird mean? Let's unpack that. All of these sorts of complexities definitely shape my experience as a child of immigrants who 
just didn't really feel any clear sense of, of connection to any one particular place. And though that was hard in so many ways, especially growing up in these white communities where there was all of the, the sort of typical questions of where are you really from? And oh, what a funny name, and especially for me growing up like in the 90s before we really had a language around cultural sensitivity and microaggressions. I think I think it really shaped the way I thought about a sort of boundary free world and questioning what it meant to have boundaries, not just national boundaries, but intergroup boundaries. And I think it's it's actually fascinating. You know, people complain about me search, but I think me search is some of the most powerful research because we really bring our own grounded knowledge to those questions. On your bio, you talked about that when the planes hit the Twin Towers on 9-11, you were in your first year of college at the University of Virginia. And you mentioned that your parents asked you at the time if you wanted to change your name. You didn't, but you said you felt then that your name was a liability, which I understand now that Karen has become a derogatory term and my name is. Karen. So I understand a little bit about how that feels. Tell us more about that. And do you still feel as though your name is a liability? Oh my gosh. I've I've thought for a long time about writing just, you know, one book specifically about names, because for me, my name, just the pronunciation of my name, the, the different ways my name has shaped who I am in different spaces, who I am before I arrive, before anybody gets to know me. It's, I mean, it's fascinating at the very least. And I think, you know, disturbing at the most. Like, I think there's a lot that we could think about when we think about what it means to have a particular name that evokes a certain set of racialized and classed ideas. And obviously, there's a ton of sociological research around this, specifically around Black names. But I think for me, you know, especially when that 9-11 moment happened, I remember coming back from, I was in my college dorm. Like I said, it was like my second year of my first year at UVA. And I came back from my dorm and everybody was sort of crowded around the TV and they're showing the footage as it's happening in real time. And I'm sitting there thinking that it must have been like a fluke. Like that was my immediate gut reaction was that, oh, like that silly pilot, like they must have been drunk or something. You know, for me, it never occurred to me that it was terrorism. And when I think about it now in this world, this post 9-11 world where every sort of act of violence immediately evokes this question of like, was it the brown terrorist? Was it the Muslim terrorist? And I know you had Evelyn Elseltani on recently. I actually listened to that episode. It was wonderful. But, you know, she really talks about the way that it shifts culture, the, the way that we think about things. And my name and the experience I've had with my name, both before and after, sort of from going to like sort of ambiguous, hard to place immigrant to clearly a sort of Muslim sounding, you know, definitely sort of a question of it. And there's also the gendered question. People see my name. They don't know if I'm a man or a woman. I get a lot of emails addressed to a Mr. Hajar. So, you know, I think those are all sort of ways that I've thought about you know, how my name is sort of this, this strange sort of sociological concept in itself. Two of the questions that have guided your research are, what are the social forces that bring us together and keep us apart? And what does it take to feel like we belong to a community and to one another? How would you answer those questions? Yeah, those are really the big questions that animate my research. They animate me just as a person on a day to day basis. And especially now as a mother, thinking about how to raise, you know, two small children in a world that is so fraught with a lot of complicated politics and, and sort of divisions that come from above. I mean, the structures really are committed to keeping us separate from one another because Lord knows what will happen if we actually garner political power together and, and come together and realize that our experiences as humans are actually quite, quite similar. Um, and so for me, there's never been a sort of easy outcome question. And when you think about sort of academic concepts of like input variables and dependent variables and, you know, how to measure some of these things. So I think for me, some of the most interesting findings that have come out of my research in answering these questions are the way that, for one thing, collective memory and just the the shared sort of sense of the past, a consciousness around where we've been, how that can bring people together. One of the things that I argue frequently is that, especially now thinking about the moral panic around critical race theory and racial education more generally, that critical education is such a lifeline. It really connects us to one another you know, across boundaries and borders and time. It makes us realize that we are not alone. We are not living these solitary lives where we are experiencing things by ourselves in ways that nobody's ever experienced them before. When you develop that sociological imagination and you understand how you're situated in a sort of larger socio-historical context within larger social forces, you realize just how many people are actually living very similar experiences 
that you're not alone and that there's a lot of power to be garnered when you come together across the shared experiences. So I think that's been one of the the most exciting findings, even though it's one of the hardest ones to kind of apply in a day to day sort of way. And, and, you know, I'm always thinking about activists and the the knowledge that they can share with us, even as academics who really care about creating these spaces and classrooms for you know, our students across all sorts of different sort of class and racialized and gendered divides to come together and learn together and share knowledge. And I think, I think really that sort of human connection, the piece where we draw out how the larger structures are one committed to dividing us, but then two, actually ways that, you know, situate our experiences, explain them, make us feel less alone. I think that's so valuable. So what inspired you to write your book, The Struggle for the People's King? So it's really interesting because people often ask me, they'll say, well, you're an Iranian immigrant. It doesn't really quite track that you wrote this book about Black civil rights and memory. And of course, you know, we don't have to study exactly who we are, that it sort of goes back to the question of the me search. But for me, there was actually this very personal connection because it was in learning civil rights history that I personally realized that my experiences of racism and xenophobia, that they weren't unique, that they were situated within this larger system of anti-Black racism, and that I wasn't alone. And so, you know, I think it was that sort of connection to the past and then also realizing just how it was being distorted that shaped the way that I approached this research initially as a graduate student. And in your book, you discuss the making of ignorance in the American educational system. And you give one example of a study by the Southern Poverty Law Center, which found that only 8% of high school seniors identified slavery as a central cause of the Civil War. Tell us more about the making of this ignorance that you describe in your book. Yes, the making of cultural ignorance, this concept from the philosopher Charles W. Mills, it is so pivotal to the way that I think about the consequences of distorting civil rights memory. And one of the big findings in the book is that it gets sort of established and institutionalized through the making of the King holiday. And so there's, you know, all of these sort of vociferous debates around whether Dr. King should be commemorated. And I think it's really hard for people to remember now because, you know, so many people think of Dr. King as just sort of this well-established, loved character. He's the sort of moral catalyst for all sorts of good in the world. He's the sort of bookend for the dark period of racism in the past. So I think when people hear that, you know, in the last year of his life, 75% of Americans had this deeply unfavorable view of Dr. King as sort of shocking. But I think it's really important to bring that to light because this is what shaped a lot of the debates that went into, are we going to commemorate him? Why should we commemorate him? There were, you know, accusations that he was a communist and he was an adulterer and sort of all sorts of ways to discredit him as this civil rights leader. So what happens is that then President Reagan realizes it's really in his best interest, even though he's anti-civil rights, he realizes it's in his best interest to support the holiday, especially because it'll help him woo white moderates and kind of shut down the accusations of racism, accusations that he's trying to roll back civil rights gains, which he effectively does throughout his presidency. And so, you know, he signs the King holiday into law. He's amid this choir that's singing the civil rights anthem, We Shall Overcome. And it's so beautiful. And then he starts getting these sort of angry notes from his political allies who are saying, how can you commemorate this guy that we all hate? And he writes letters back to them behind closed doors. He's assuring him, assuring all of these allies that he is going to preserve a very sanitized and selective version of Dr. King. It's going to be one that is stripped of King's radical history. It's going to focus on King as a sort of individualist, somebody who would support a free market, this sort of neoliberal project. And that he's going to sort of bookmark the end of racism. And so this is really the way that this revisionist history gets institutionalized and then gets taken up over decades. Why is this such an important book for 2023? You know, when I started writing this book, I believed it would be important because I, as I say in the introduction of the book, I was writing it in this moment where Abigail Fisher was taking affirmative action to the Supreme Court. She was trying to repeal it. And I never would have imagined that it would become even more relevant as I was writing, as we entered the Trump era, you know, as we entered the period where there was a January 6th insurrection based on this idea of white replacement. 
And now here we are in 2023, where just recently, Florida passed this legislation where they're writing a history where Black Americans benefited from slavery. This is a completely distorted history where Black Americans gained skills from being enslaved. And this is a huge question mark at the end. This leads to my next question, which was an article that you wrote entitled Racism is a Pandemic Too. Tell us more about that. Yeah, you know, this is actually a a project I'm working on right now. And I'm thinking about Gen Z activists and particularly how they're contending with COVID and this sort of intersecting racial time bomb that happens in 2020 where they're disrupted in this really pivotal moment in their life course. And especially for Black and Brown activists, they're understanding this as this sort of duality where it's not just about the racism that they've experienced through the pandemic, the sort of unequal distribution of healthcare, of housing, of education, They're also experiencing the reactionary politics after the George Floyd moment, where George Floyd is murdered under the knee of a white police officer. And there's this question of, you know, is society itself the real pandemic? Is racism that's embedded within these systems the the sort of larger question? Is that the pandemic? And so they're really taking both of these things on at once. And the the really tough thing in interviewing a lot of these students is the depth of the trauma that they experienced through the pandemic. And a lot of the inequality that's built in, when you compare, for example, some of the students I interviewed who understandably had mental health issues, they were stuck at home, they missed their friends, but they were safe. Their parents were safe. They had stable jobs. They didn't have to worry. And you compare these to the students who lost family members or had family members who had no choice but to be on the front lines. They experienced that fear every single day of their parents contracting this virus and then not having the health insurance to get the care that they needed. And that sort of inequality that's built into even the way that we experience the world around us every single day, the way that we experience a social disaster like the pandemic, these are the sort of larger questions that I'm really thinking about. What other projects are you currently working on that you might like to share with us? Yeah, you know, I'm really excited about a project that's nearing completion. And it's one that I've been conducting with a former graduate student who's now a soon-to-be assistant professor, Blanca Ramirez. And we've been looking at voting rights legislation, specifically voter ID laws. And we've been looking at how they actually reshape the way that immigrant serving organizations do their work. Because I think there's sort of a common conception that when you introduce a really stringent voting legislation, it's going to create this chilling effect on political engagement. So people will be more worried about voting, they're less likely to vote, it'll be harder to vote. And then on the other hand, there's this literature that shows it can actually create this sort of reactive politicization of communities that are marginalized because all of a sudden they're really aware of the limitation of their rights. And so we're taking on this puzzle to kind of investigate, you know, which one is happening? How is it happening? And then can we sort of scale up and think about ways to increase voter engagement amongst communities that are targeted? And is there anything else you'd like to tell us about you or your work? I think one of the most exciting things to me right now, just more generally in sociology, and I've seen this in other sort of social scientific circles, is a commitment to thinking about imagined futures, trying to think kind of beyond the boundaries of how we've thought about our work before. I think there is this tendency to want to focus specifically on representing reality. And I think that's so important. But I think some of the most valuable work we can do is take that, that sort of representation of reality, and think about how we can expand beyond what's been done, beyond the boundaries of what's imaginable. Are there alternative worlds that we can be creating actively, even by putting our work out there, working with communities that are on the ground every day, trying to create a different future, and then try to come together and think about, you know, What are some of the patterns in the ways that we're limited in our imagination? How can we expand that imagination on a sort of larger scale? And where can listeners find out more about you? Yeah, they can find me at my website. It's www.hajarwazdiha.com. And I'm also holding on for dear life on Twitter. So they can also find me there. It's at Haj Yazdiha. It was great to have you on the show, Hajar. Thank you so much for taking time to be a guest on the Curious Professor podcast. Thank you so much for having me. And now for the answer to this episode's trivia question. Where did Dr. Martin Luther King give his famous I Have a Dream speech? On August 28, 1963, Dr. King delivered his I Have a Dream speech to over 250,000 civil rights supporters from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C.
We'll end the show with something punny. The past, the present, and the future walked into a bar. It was tense. Thank you for joining me for this episode of the Curious Professor podcast. If there's a person, place, artifact, or natural wonder that has sparked your curiosity and you'd like for me to feature it on the show, please let me know. My website is thecuriousprofessorpodcast.com. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to subscribe to the Curious Professor podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you'd like to become part of my community of curiosity seekers, be sure to visit my website, thecuriousprofessorpodcast.com, and join Dr. B's Hive. Until next time, always be learning and be curious with Dr. B.